Good evening, listeners, brave navigators of the enigmatic and the concealed. Have you ever felt the pull of the unanswered, the allure of the mysteries that shroud our existence? For more than a decade, a unique comic publisher has dared to dive into these mysteries, unafraid of the secrets they might uncover. This audacious entity is Paranoid American. Welcome to the mystifying universe of the Paranoid American podcast. Launched in the year 2012, Paranoid American has been on a mission to decipher the encrypted secrets of our world. From the unnerving enigma of MK Ultra mind control to the clandestine assemblies of secret societies. From the awe-inspiring frontiers of forbidden technology to the arcane patterns of occult symbols in our very own pop culture. They have committed to unveiling the concealed realities that lie just beneath the surface. Join us as we navigate these intricate landscapes, decoding the hidden scripts of our society and challenging the accepted perceptions of reality. Folks, I've got a big problem on my hands. There's a company called Paranoid American making all these funny memes and comics. Now, I'm a fair guy. I believe in free speech uh, as long as it doesn't cross the line. And if these AI-generated memes dare to make fun of me, they're crossing the line. This is your expedition into the realm of the extraordinary, the secret, the shrouded. Come with us as we sift through the world's grand mysteries, question the standardized narratives, and brave the cryptic labyrinth of the concealed truth. So strap yourselves in, broaden your horizons, and steel yourselves for a voyage into the enigmatic heart of the paranoid American podcast. Where each story, every image, every revelation brings us one step closer to the elusive truth. Thank you for coming to one more episode of the Paranoid American Podcast. And uh, we've got another interesting guest, as we always do. But this time we've got Gary Wayne, who's going to give us like the true scoop. He's going to inform a bumpkin like me about a topic that I guess I've been going really hard on lately. Thanks a lot to Joel Thomas and uh, Tony Merkel and the confessionals. But they told, told me, I asked, like, where, who can I talk to to give me like the true inside scoop on all this? And Joel was emphatic about talk to Gary Wayne. So I think I contacted you like like months ago, like last year. And we had scheduled this for quite a while, right around the release of your brand new book, The Genesis Six Conspiracy Part Two. Uh, but before we even get into all the questions, I like to, you know, let you introduce yourself and tell people where to find you and and what your project is. Yeah, so fe- people who may not be familiar with me, I, re- I wrote two books. One released uh, yesterday, the second book. So Genesis 6, Conspiracy Part 1, How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Humankind. And Part 2, that just released yesterday, How Understanding Prehistory and Giants Helps to Define End-Time Prophecy. So I'm a Christian contrarian. And I came about this type of research sort of kicking and screaming and took me a while to come around because of the cognizant dissonance that you get with giants and stuff like that, particularly out of the Bible. And and at the time, I wasn't even a, even a Christian at that time. So it's a kind of a long story how I got here. But when I say I'm a contrarian, I tend not to accept what somebody says or what somebody says something sad or is. I tend to want to verify it myself. So I do all of my research, uh, by biblically wise or non-biblically wise, um, by verifying things myself. And this sort of passion all kind of intersected as I got onto this track to try and understand what was going on with prophecy on a challenge that I took with my previous passions that I had before coming back to be a Christian. And when I was growing up, I was a avid reader and an avid fan of history, ancient history, prehistory, mythology, and I read sort of everything I could get my hands on. So it kind of gave me a lot of different nexus points and data points in terms of when I was starting to read things um, in, in the Old Testament. So, um, so the first book that I wrote, it's kind of trying to draw in for people all around the world, whether you're a Christian or not, even though it has a Christian biases, is that we have a common history that's told in all cultures, a common prehistory, a common history. It affects what's happening today, and it also has the same type of narratives, no matter what religion or perspective that you're in, 
in terms of what the future will be and, and what we know, what we understand biblically as end time prophecy. Now, one is seen through a polytheist lens. Uh, Christians and monotheists uh, look through it through a monotheist lens. And then, of course, you got the secular sort of understanding that kind of branches out into the alien kind of mythos, but they're all talking about the same thing. So book one was sort of designed to demonstrate to people that there's this common history and legacy and uh, it's had, uh, I think it's changed the conversation in so many ways out there in this, this genre that overlaps into a whole bunch of different things. And that book two, I wrote, not because I thought I should write it at the beginning. I didn't really decide that until I got into it that I should write it. I wrote it in a response to Christians who are starved at what's written in the Bible, and they're not taught this in churches, and they're not taught this in um, you know anywhere that they go. So prophecy and prehistory is kind of one of those things you just don't talk about in Christian churches for some reason, um, which we can talk about. Um, and so I listened to the audience and I wrote the sequel and I set aside a book I was already 300 pages into. So um, the, once I got the calling, I got the, I got the understanding, it came pretty easily. So book two, even if you're not Christian, if you want to know more about giants, if you want to know more about what happened in prehistory, if you want to know how these mysterious things affect what happens today and what happens in the end time from a Christian perspective. You're going to learn more about gods, fallen angels, giants, hybrid giants, and a whole bunch of other things that you wondered about uh, out of prehistory that you never thought about or connected in in that kind of manner. I do want to know about all that stuff. And I'm, I was delighted when you answered the first question preemptively before I even got a chance to, because you called yourself a, like a Christian contrarian. And I'm just wondering when you were a lover of just history and philosophy and all the other uh, areas that you were describing, were you always a contrarian in those areas too? Yes. Or was it just yes. reserved for your religious studies? I was. I didn't realize so that. So were you a, like a troublemaker in school? Yeah, I'm a rascal. There's no doubt about that. So um, troublemaker, <laughs> contrarian, against the status quo, always fighting against the uh, the common flow of society. Yeah, I'm just sort of naturally that way. So what's really kind of nice, though, is I was able over time to understand that generally when I was going against the flow, you know, there was opportunity, whether it's business wise or otherwise, because generally the whole flow of society you're not really getting ahead that way. You're just trying to keep up with the stream. So, uh, and so what this allowed me to do was to sort of really cultivate that contrarian concept. And so getting into the Christian community from a different sort of perspective, not always welcoming at, at, at first and probably still not welcomed by a lot of the mainstream establishment, so to speak, religious aspect that's more interested in their business than they are in uh, guiding the flock at times. They have teach good principles, but it's completely out of context with the rest of the Bible, my opinion. And so, but I can, I can tend to back that up. So that's why it's helpful if you're going to be a contrarian, that you do it in the contrarian where you try and verify everything yourself, because then you're not relying on what somebody said that was inaccurate. And you said when you started on this, that you weren't necessarily a Christian at that point. So what, what no. were you? Well, I, you know, I grew up uh, initially in, in the Baptist church, but by the time I was a teenager, I was totally into the flow of science and peer pressure. And so I was strictly sort of secular and I was a fan of evolution and everything that we we're going with the sciences. And I love science fiction and that sort of utopian world that they promise for us that's out in the stars. That was me. I was, that's it. Space that's communism. what I'm up for. What's that? Space communism, that's Star yes. Trek. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so so would you what would you say that you were atheist or agnostic? Would you even go in one of those two camps or just kind of a vague secular? I I, I, I was basically atheist at that point. I had gone from 
you know, thinking, you know, uh, there was a God and everything like that. But then I went over to basically atheism and in that, you know, we're sort of in, in on this all, all alone, but I had a challenge to read a, a book and it was a prophecy book by a fellow by the name of Hal Lindsay. If I had the courage to do it, and we were drinking heavily on a Friday night when I was young, when the challenge came and they were talking about antichrist and false prophet. And then they challenged me to write this book called the late great planet earth. So I did. And it scared the socks off of me because if even part of it was true, this was something I needed to know more of. So then I thought, well, you you can look it up in the Bible, but you don't know whether or not. And I was pretty, uh, pretty much anti a lot of the televangelists and things like that because they tend to manipulate and they're after the money and all these other things except for and peter so, popoff because if you got the the holy water and you sprinkled it on your mailbox <laughs> then you would get a check for like 30 grand from like exactly a yeah board. yeah Too that bad. one always that worked wasn't... all the other ones were scams though <laughs> yeah so I thought, well, okay, the the passages are verified, but that doesn't mean it's in context or it's not manipulated. So that started me on this sort of long process that I need to learn about the Bible. So you have to start by reading it. And it was painful for me. I had to stop and get a, a an NIV Bible because the Baconian English was driving me crazy. And so uh, I read that. But, you know, the Old Testament to me was still very, very dry, and I was trying to just sort of understand it. But as I got into it and I, I understood things more, it started to sort of come to life to me. And so I was tracking all of these different prophecy narratives, and I'm logging them down in files. I started off with highlighters and found out I ran out of colors pretty fast. So then I had to set up a new system. And you, know, you get to Genesis 6 as you're doing this. And as I read in the first one, it's like it's talking about giants. I'm going, whatever that is, I don't want to have anything to do with it. So I just ignored it for several years uh, in my research. And then at one point in time, I'm going like, you know, there's giants both before and after the flood, different kinds of giants. There's demons, angels, and at least the demons and the angels, if my understanding at that point in time, were somehow involved with end time prophecy, which, I, which I'm thinking, well, how do I understand that in terms of what's going on here? And so then I decided I would start logging um, the giant narratives. And of course, you never really get it all the first time through. So you have to do it many times. And it was many years as I just keeping adding to the file. And when I had a lot of information put together, I thought, you know, I could write a lot of books here if I wanted to. But, you know, I'm not a theologian. I don't have a platform. I don't have a university education. Um, and that I don't even know whether I can write a book and if I could write a book, would somebody want to publish it? And if somebody did want to publish it, would anybody buy it? And would anybody read it? And would anybody like it? So you have all of that that I'm wrestling with. So I thought, well, instead of getting into significant end time prophecy in the beginning, why don't I write a short book, which was the plan? I just want to connect Genesis 6, where they have the creation of the giants with end time prophecy, where you have like, you know, the false prophet, antichrist, demons, angels, uh, fallen angels, and just write something quickly. So I did that fairly quickly with about 10 chapters and then i realized you know it's so incomplete that and i know the prehistory and things that i've read uh, to a certain degree they all link whether it's prehistory or end time prophecy so why don't i just start putting stuff in about um what i know about giants in greek mythology or sumerian mythology and things like that so I did that and did that pretty quickly. And then I thought, well, for people who aren't familiar with those cultures, they don't have sort of a frame of reference. So I think I need to learn more about those religions. So I had to read all of these different kinds of religious books from the Popol Vuh to uh, the Book of Mormon to the Gnostic scriptures to the Vedas, to, you, you name it. If it was uh, written down something other than oral tradition, I wanted to sort of link that in. And so after doing that, then you realize, well, okay, so that's the religious aspect of what's going on with the whole overall hierarchy in the culture. But there's also these mystery schools that are associated with these religions all over the world. So I start looking more into the mystery schools, and that's the education for the elite, not the mundane third and fourth classes in the same 
fourth class feudal system that was established worldwide. And so it's just the noble elite. But within these mystery schools, you have these secret societies, similar to what you have in our degree-based system in education today with initiatory organizations on university campuses. Um, And so I started to dig into that, and I learned that secret societies take their beginnings back to these mystery schools and back to the seven sacred sciences that were used to form the original uh, r- r- knowledge religions or Gnostic religions um, that, you know, formed uh, the mystery schools. And then, uh, then I realized, well, I don't know anything about secret societies, but I've heard a lot about the Illuminati and whatever, right? So I had to learn all about secret societies. And then that took me down rabbit holes for probably a decade and you could you just there's so much stuff out there every time you ask a question there's just more things to find out but at some point in time i thought i got to put this together so that took me so i started writing the book in about 1996 and by about 2013 i thought i might be ready to start <laughs> looking for a publisher so and my research started in 1981 this sounds very familiar to me, I've got a few long-term projects that might be like another six years in the works. I'm, yeah. I'm curious right away. What did you glean from Mormonism that was specific to giants and, I guess, Nephilim or anything else that would be something that people might not have heard about Mormonism yeah. already? Well, what's interesting is, is you know, if you don't know anything about Mormonism other than the people are absolutely terrific, um, it's a very interesting sort of. Uh, branch of Christianity, and I know a lot of people would look at it not as Christianity, but I'll leave that up to other people. They look at themselves as Christians. And so its structure is very much like a polytheist religion. And they have not just the elders at the top, but these are like adepts. And they can actually add on to scripture and they have terms and things that they talk about that is distinct from what is taught in the Bible. Let's just say different. And then you take that back to the pacifism movement, which is, you know, started by generally Freemasons and secret society members. And same with Mormonism, as you take that back to their founders. And then you find out that Joseph Smith receives all of this information as it's like being dictated to him by an angel or a demon or a fallen angel, which everywhere you want to fall in on that, he just receives it. And he just he's writing it down as almost even sort of possessed or controlled because he has to write at such a speed. And so he gets all of this history that comes at them. And so with that as one of the sort of frames of context, I was a little bit reluctant reluctant to dig too deep into this because it's it was kind of different. So I read the Book of Mormon and I read it several times. And, you know, in, in that it's like getting an initiatory Bible from Freemasonry, which just has a few pages that are separated for the initiates because they're not adept yet to study on and some terms and things that they need to know. Whereas the adept Bible is completely different and it has more of the polytheist influence significantly. And it's part of the larger polychronicon that was their oral tradition that they eventually put down in writing in the Middle Ages. And so... Book of Mormon is kind of like that, and a lot of it is sort of repetitive to what's in the New Testament, but then they have this history that goes back to the time of um, Nephi and uh, at the time and and the people of Jared, as, as I recall, and around 600 BC, so about the time when the Babylonians uh, moved into the Middle East and they took the southern kingdom of Judah in exile to Babylon. But yet they take their bloodline tradition and their knowledge legacy back to the time of the Tower of Babel. Uh, And so the brother of Jared is considered this mighty one, like a giant, like Nimrod is kind of described just as giants, Nephilim uh, and Raphaim after the flood were described as mighty ones and and men of renown. And that there were some of these large and mighty men, even in the time after those peoples had migrated over to North America. So 
not a lot in there that I could really use based on all of that. But I made a note that, again, they have a recollection even in their additions to the Bible about uh, possible giants and bloodlines. So, But other than that, I mean, um, I would say I'm not a fan of the leadership, but I'm not a fan of the Roman Catholic leadership as well. Um, and I'm not a fan of most organizational leaderships and Christians. I think uh, the Bible is great, um, but I don't think they're leading the flocks as well as they ought to. And they're more focused on their own slant and biases than uh, agenda than what's in the Bible. Do you think anyone's closer than the others or if anyone's farther away than the others that you'd be willing to call out? Uh, no, I think, you know, I think they all teach the principles of the Bible well. Um, so they have that in common. Um, I think there are some, particularly in the evangelicals, that focus a little bit more on prophecy than others. Um, so they would be a little bit sort of closer, but it doesn't matter sort of which church that I've done research on. I wish more of them did it, but there's so few. Most don't teach the accuracy of prehistory, and they really like to avoid prophecy. And But then again... That's because I think their seminary schools, both in the Catholic system and in the Protestant system, have been influenced by polytheists, and particularly the secret societies with an agenda to not teach those things. Would, uh, what would be the safeguards in, in the world we live in today, right, where there's kids that their goal is to just be an influencer and just like, what do you want to be famous? Like famous for yeah. what? No, just, just get right to the famous part. Yeah. How do you prevent people? If you make prophecy sort of like an acceptable widespread thing, doesn't just everyone assume that they're a prophet at some point and start like convincing themselves that they're all prophets. Yeah. Cause my understanding is that the Roman Catholic church and even Mormonism yeah. modern day, they've kind of put like a subtle squash on it. Like, no, no, yeah. Like the prophecy times are kind of over. We don't do that anymore yeah, yeah. because I assume if they open that gate, like all of a sudden, just that thousands of people every yeah. day or, um, you know, I just got a dream. And now all of a sudden what do you do about that. So, well, biblically, we're told that, um, and particularly through the Old Testament in Daniel 9, that there's 70 weeks and it's a set time uh, from that point forward when all prophecy is going to be done, fulfilled and everything happens. And so that ends in the generation, except for one week at the time of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And that generation that continues, it's still part of that. So you get the apostles and you get the disciples in terms of the prophecy, but the last week of that is the last seven years of this age. So, I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, the Almighty can't create prophets anytime that he wants because he can do whatever he feels is good. But typically, these prophets are wrong. So they're not really prophets of God because they can't be wrong. And typically, they use it to either do two things. One is, is to raise themselves up, which is always wrong. Um, it's not about the messenger. It's about the message. And secondly, so you shouldn't be, you know, getting gain ill-conceived that way on it. And your focus should be more on, on, on getting information out there. And or um, these ones are using it to ex exert power over people or to put them down because they'll say, I'm a prophet. I have the Holy Spirit. I have this. I have that. Or I speak to God regularly. All these things that they cannot prove. Um, and their prophecies certainly don't do themselves any favor because they're usually wrong. So one wants to be very, very careful on that. And so I get asked a lot, do you think you're a prophet? Well, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a minister. I'm a researcher. And I present information to people. And I'm not necessarily trying to convert people. I think everybody's here and has an opportunity for free choice. And we need to learn everything about what's going on in this world and decide for ourselves whatever you decide. Uh, from my research, I've made that decision, uh, and I can connect dots. And I, what I hope to do with people who aren't Christians is because I can connect things into the Bible from around the world, but always from, I always use a, a biblical biases as a Christian, um, that they might give the Bible a look 
because there's a lot more in there than what Christians know and a lot more in there of what non-Christians know. What do you think about Joseph Smith being a prophet? Because that's clearly after 70 AD, right? This is like the it, early 1800s. It is. Yeah. Well, and I could accept that um, if uh, if I could see the prophet aspect of it. But it's sort of just sort of repeating stuff. If there is, you know, for whatever prophecy that's in there, that would be already stated in the Bible uh, and almost word for word. So, um but what is disturbing, though, about the leadership uh, of the Mormon Church for me is, is that they can change Scripture. They believe they have the authority of God to rewrite the Bible if they wanted to in any way that they want it. And that is a step too far. There's nothing biblically that comes out of the Hebrew text or the original apostles and disciples that says they have that power to do that. And so even when... Uh, the Roman Church says that the Pope is infallible. That's not true either. <laughs> and we see that all you know all the time. I'm not saying they're evil people necessarily, but don't say that you're infallible and don't support that doctrine. I was gonna. That was the other really good example because I was brought up Roman Catholic and I understood that it wasn't that the Vatican changes the Bible, but they can change the interpretation. So, like yes. yesterday this passage meant one thing and even though the yep. words stay the same it gets reinterpreted yes. and now it means a completely different thing and that was always an interest it was almost like a bunch of lawyers like i i used to always assume yeah. that if you get to the high level of the vatican it's just like yep. being in like a high priced courtroom yeah. well and the thing is is when you're into the legalism you're into polytheism how so well, that's where it all comes from. So uh, the, the organizational structure, uh, both before and after the flood, both uh, and particularly after the flood, where we would have more uh, sort of empirical evidence of that, is that you have a very much decentralized organization, temples that don't sort of work together in in um, in Israel and in Judah, even though you would have the place of the Holy of Holies, uh, and you have Levites that are the priests all throughout, and you have this very flat sort of structure in that they have the law, but there's no reinterpreting the law uh, until the New Covenant, where um, we understand that there's more to it than just the law. And he's there to not abolish the law, but but to fulfill it, and that you're, if you believe, your sins will be forgiven. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't laws that we should be fine, but it's the application of how that is applied in terms of the spirit of it. And polytheism, uh, they can interpret things any way that they want because that's their belief system. And everything's done through allegories, taciturn symbols, all sorts of metaphors and things like that. And they're the ones who initiated the oath-based society. <laughs> And so everything is done through oaths and through the laws that they've set up to divide things up, typically for the elite um, that has dominated the world ever since. So it's their system. So when you have a Baconian Bible uh, written in English that is uh, done by the mighty Prince James, who's a initiated adept of polytheism from childhood as being part of the bloodlines, um, and uh, way higher than a first level adept. So if you see him with images uh, that are out there where he is being initiated as a Freemasonry Freemason, he would have been higher than first level adept by the time he was like six years old. <laughs> so <laughs> way higher than that. So that's just uh, uh, doing things on a sort of a respectful kind of nature as opposed to where, where they fall. And so this... Bible was printed not only for political reasons to unite uh, his empire under one Bible and sort of try and bring back all of the tensions that's going on with the Puritans and that's going on with the Quakers and with uh, the uh, 
the Catholics and all the other Protestants. It was pretty messy back then. And you have a Scottish king taking over the Elizabeth throne at that point in time. So he's trying to unify it like Constantine did with using Christianity and then merging a lot of polytheism into that to unite his Roman Empire and something that was used back in Persia as well with Zoroastrianism. So it's a common sort of thing that they do. But this was brought in to swear oaths on, just as you do that in the secret societies and in mystical religions and used in swearing that you're going to tell the truth in the court of law. You have oaths of allegiance. You have it's just everywhere. And biblically, we're told not to swear oaths. Right. But it's where on do, the Bible, too, even in the courtroom. Yeah. Yeah. But if you do swear an oath, God is going to hold us accountable for it. So if you do swear an oath, you have to fulfill it or you're going to be held accountable for it. So are you saying that, that God helps the Freemasons enforce their blood oaths? So if you violate nope. a Freemasonic oath when you go to heaven... He's like, hey, you actually violated this oath. I think uh, you went, if, you, if you would continue sort of with that, w the logical playing it out is, is you have, would have somebody showing up who holds the deed to your soul and spirit, um, particularly the soul aspect from a polytheist perspective versus a Christian perspective of the spirit. So he has the title to the people who swear their oaths to him and continue to fulfill that. So there's a good biblical example of this. And so in the time of Moses, as the story goes in the, in the Bible, is he's adopted into the royal Raphaim family bloodline of the pharaohs and raised as a bloodline, educated at Heliopolis into the mysteries, which was this either the most central powerful location of polytheism after the flood and or next to the Magi that was going on in, in Sumeria and Mesopotamia, but still branches of the same religion that shows up after the flood. And he swears his oath and becomes an adept as a royale, educated in the mysteries from childhood as what all royales are. And he is going to be perhaps the next pharaoh until he has the falling out after killing the Egyptian and finding out who he was. And then he gets ostracized and then he comes back and he starts the exodus. Now, what's really important in all of this is that when he dies and he's not permitted to go across the Jordan River and into the covenant land for some of the things that happen within the exodus, um, Satan shows up to claim his body. And he has legal title to it because he swore those oaths to him while being educated at Heliopolis and becoming uh, an extraordinary high level adept of the highest probably proportions of that time and everything that sort of goes with it. But God has being omnipotent from a Christian perspective trumps that. He sends Michael to say, yes, he did that, but he did that on my behest so that he could communicate and do uh, what I wanted him to do. So he could talk at the Royale level and in the language of the polytheists and do things like with the staff, with full understanding of if they throw down their staff and turn it into the snake, what that means in terms of whose God is greater. He's got to take part in the wizard war so he can fight yes. back in their little yeah. wizard war with his brazen serpent. Yeah, so he's raised to to understand all of that and to to lead Israel out after being raised in in one of the beast empires. So um, it's yeah, that's one sort of biblical example of the power that Satan has over those who swear their oaths to them. But God can write you a note from home, like kind of like your mom writing you like a sick note and say like excuse little moses today like actually everything's well, good uh there is he was sick because well, we kept them home to get you know oh no that, that would be sort of a an exaggeration or a distortion so uh we all sin there's only one that didn't that was sent um and that's why it's important that there was that sacrifice to to forgive all sins and that there's a point that you can cross where you're not going to be forgiven. So, for example, you have laws against uh, creation, 
and blasphemies against the Holy Spirit, which is going to be merged into the mark of the beast in the end time. So even humans who are uh, going to take that mark along with the demons, as well as the fallen angels, they're going to the lake of fire. But the problem is with that is there's a difference between crossing the line from the second death to burning forever. And so that's a line that people want to be very, very careful of crossing and that um, this uh, <clears throat> this uh, violation sort of you could sort of make it uh, manifested in breaking the laws of creation as in DNA manipulation to a certain degree to create like these chimera type of beasts that are talked about in polytheism before the flood uh, and with some sort of spirit that they don't have the ability to add. So there has to be some sort of sexual nature that's added to pass on that counterfeit spirit, just as angels had sex with human females to create the giants both before and after the flood that's accounted for inexplicably in all cultures around the world on all continents. And who knows what we'll find in Antarctica once we can find that out. So if it's not recorded there, fine. But in all continents that we have access to properly, we have record of that. And the other one sort of comes within its combination of the knowledge and it's, it's really sort of deep subject. But a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the spirit that provides the spirit for the soul and the body. And the counterfeiting of that spirit is part of that and creating a counterfeit Holy Spirit. Because in polytheism, their trinity would include a, a male god, a female goddess, and some sort of offspring. So the allegory, let's say for Gnosticism and low-level uh, adepts of Freemasonry, would be allegorized in Osiris, Isis, and Horus as that sort of holy trinity from a polytheist perspective. And so um, creating that mother goddess that is the fertility goddess and the knowledge goddess, just as Sophia is the goddess of wisdom in Gnosticism, from which the theology of religion comes from. The love of Sophia as philosophy is defined, or the love of the Sophia goddess who provided this knowledge and has will be providing in the allegories, whether it's the Atman particle or the divine essence, this connection to the mark of the beast that provides all knowledge that is in the universe um, that is sort of this invisible particle that merges uh, with this measurable particle at the quantum level that transmits this knowledge throughout all dimensions through quantum entanglement, probably what the people at CERN are looking for, uh, because to promise godhood in the end time, you have to provide immortality and unlimited knowledge. So they have to solve a way to how do we give an oiketarian that's not going to decay, that's a dwelling place for the spirit, just as the spirit dwells in the oiketarian, a soul and a body of the physical world, the spirit comes from heaven and then goes back when a human dies, but a disembodied counterfeit spirit doesn't go to heaven, and it's either going to go to the sides of the pit prison, as Ezekiel 32 talks about, into the home of Sheol and Hades, where their gods reign from, if they do the right rituals and are taken there in polytheism, or they're going to roam as demon spirits that possess people, as we would better know them as, because they can't get to their uh, heaven for reasons that are we could talk about, uh, but there's three locations where those bodies go, but they don't go to sleep because it's a counterfeit immortal spirit. And so they have to supply this orchitarian, whether it's through a clone body, transhumanism, and they can't supply a spirit because they don't control that. So the only thing that's going to occupy these oikotarians isn't a human spirit. It's going to be the disembodied spirit of the giants and not something that humans are going to be, even though they're told they can, would be able to participate in the new age after this great destruction by fire that Shiva is sort of known for as the destroyer god who recreates a new earth after the world is destroyed by fire. And just as the new age says, we're going into that age of fire uh, so that there can be a new cycle that starts. And just as the Phoenix rises out of the ashes in polytheism, which is that uh, allegory for the people that are in the physical world, is that this world will be designed if they were to win the war for their spurious offspring 
that they're going to provide this oiketarian or a dwelling place for for the spirit, but not for humans. I, mean, I know that I was a long it's time, time to get right? into the. Well, it's time to get into <laughs> the giant. You brought it up, and that's sort of the the basis for a lot of. I guess the thing that you said you were skipping over, right? When you first got into yeah. this, it was like, well, want nothing you know, to do with it. Part. <laughs> so I'm just like the, the basics, the basics to start with when we say yeah. giant and let's mm -hmm. talk about the very first giants where the watchers come down. How big are we talking that these Nephilim were? Mm -hmm. Are we saying like hundreds of feet, thousands of feet, 20 feet? Yeah, because this is before the flood and, um, uh, for people who are trying to understand prehistory, understand a flood is in all cultures all around the world. And it's the exact same story, just the lens that I talked about earlier that people are looking at it through. You have parent gods that ruled before the flood, and you have offspring gods that rule after the flood. If people aren't familiar with that term, and I'm getting to your point, but just to set the table, is Kronos and Gaia were parent gods in the Greek mythology, and then Zeus and the offspring gods take over after the flood. Baal is an offspring god after the flood in the Bible, and his parent god El ruled from Mount Saphon or Mount Hermon from before the flood. Osiris and I Isis are offspring gods, Ra and Ptah and all of the Ogdod gods are the parent gods. In the Sumerian pantheon, you have Enki and Enlil, uh, Marduk, gods like that, that are offspring gods. And then the parent gods are like Tiamat, Absu, Anu, gods like that. So it's constant, same sort of constant around the flood. Parent gods rule before the flood. Offspring gods will rule after the flood, and then you'll start to understand the chronology a little bit better of that of that history. So when we look at these giants, we don't really have a lot of written records from prehistory. We get legends and things that are a little bit mercurial that are carried forward after the flood. So some people think they were as high, as large as, you know, 450 feet to 500 feet tall. And where they get that from is out of the Book of Enoch. Problem is, is we don't have original Hebrew manuscript for that. And we get different transliterations coming down. We have some fragments of the Book of Enoch. And so you get Aramaic, you get Greek, you get Slavonic, and you get Giaz, all different languages that it was translated in. So in the Giaz version, which is the older version that we have in terms of its translation, the Aramaic version is a little bit shorter, not as complete, was discovered amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then the Greek ones are derivatives of both the Giaz or the Aramaic. In the Giaz version, it says they were 300 L's. In the Aramaic version, it says 300 cubits for the antediluvian giants. Cubit, standard cubit is 18 inches, so one and a half feet. A royal cubit generally is 21 inches, so three inches larger. Um, so you're going to look at somewhere 450 to 500 feet if that were a cubit, but the original word is L's, not cubit. And so we don't know what a dimension of an L is. So it could be an inch for all we know, right? Or, or whatever the measurement was. So the best guess with the antediluvian giants is some people think as high as 100 feet tall. I'm thinking that might be a bit of a stretch as well. I'm thinking 20 to 40 feet tall um, based on some of the reliefs that they show in comparison with, with humans for antediluvian giants versus post-diluvian giants. And so after the flood, there's something more distinct about these giants, and they're not as large, and they don't have as many powers and gifts. There's been a change. Uh, and so when the offspring gods like Baal and Ashtaroth create the Raphaim after the flood, or Nin, a uh, fertility goddess of Sumeria, mates with uh, King Lugal Banda of Uruk, fifth generation after the flood to produce the sixth generation Gilgamesh, who's two-thirds God and one-third human, so creation after the flood. He is 19 cubits, but he's the king of Uruk. So generally, and as Josephus says, the measure of the giants, because they're the royals, the kings of God, uh, Rex Deus, the bloodlines of the royals today, the descendants, that they should be measured on a royal cubit, which was 21 inches as he provides that dimension from a, from a Hebrew perspective. So that makes him at 11 cubits tall and 7 cubits wide 
that puts him at about 19 feet tall and seven feet wide. Huge. Maybe not as huge as other people say the ones were before the flood. And he's the largest one we get a record of written down and in several different texts. So he's in the Ugaritic text. He's in Akkadian text. He's in Sumerian text. He's in all the different languages and it's the same dimension. So you get from the different data points that they're either all relying on the same version or uh, there's different accounts over time that is carried forward that as the veracity. Biblically, with the Rephaim giants, you get King Og's bed as a measurement after the flood of being nine cubits and four cubits wide. And it was made of iron because it couldn't hold his, uh, his weight. So using a royal cubit, because he's the king of Ashtaroth, and Edrai, the cities of Baal and Ashtaroth, as Ugaritic text talks about and describes their creation after the flood, um, he's a royale. So that's going to put his bed of iron at about 16 feet tall, just a touch shy, and seven feet wide. But he's going to have to fit into that bed. So he's going to be smaller than that. So he's going to be as part of the last of the original Rephaim after the flood. He is going to be somewhere between, if you want to use a, a, a Sorry, a standard cubit of 18 inches starting at 12 feet. He's going to be maybe as high as 13 and a half, 14, 14 and a half feet. And he's going to be four to five feet wide. And that ratio is the general accepted ratio of the giants in terms of a two to one height to width ratio uh, basis, which means that they are 50% wider or stout as uh, as they were described biblically, not as in fat, but in wide, like a WF wrestler or a lineman. They weren't just tall and sort of gangly. Um, so these were powerful beings. And so he would have been, say, four to five feet wide, maybe six feet wide, but sort of round or stout, sort of looking from that kind of kind of dimension. So you go 400 years after that, and you have uh, Goliath, who is six cubits in a span, as he's recorded in the Bible. And he's the king of Gath and a royale. So 21 inches, according to Josephus, would put him at 11 feet, three inches tall. And he'd be stout, as he's also described. So similar sort of dimensions on that um, two to one height to width ratio. So that's just sort of a brief sort of look at some of it. So some of the post-Diluvian giants, uh, from the Zeus Olympian gods after the flood, you could look at Orontes. He's depicted at about 12 feet tall. Uh, so in that range of, of Goliath, only a little bit taller. Achilles was 12 feet tall. Um, and you get a lot of accounts in the Greek mythology uh, of about 12 feet tall after the flood. But some of the things talked about before the flood is kind of crazy. <laughs> Well, it sounds like there's a progressive shrinking over, like even the Nephilim are not immune to shrinkflation, it sounds like, over the, well, like, the, the long course of time here. So something, something's changed. So in Genesis 6-3, um, there's a stop put on to what's created with the original Nephilim before the flood. And their life is limited to 120 years. So when they were originally created, they had an immortal counterfeit spirit in a body that was able to sustain itself forever. And so as the sort of Jewish tradition comes down about that is as God was going to prevent an immortal being living forever in the physical world. And so that's one of the violations against the laws of creation. So their flesh was limited to 120 years. Um, now, they did everything they could through knowledge and the technology that they developed both before the flood. And I think the knowledge before the flood is what we're just catching up to, to today. Um, and that nothing is new under the sun and what was will be again. That's common knowledge from a polytheist perspective. But that was a quote that I gave out of the Bible. So we need to understand there's some cycles on these things. And we're, I think we're just get, getting back in that cycle to what happened by the violence and the technology that was used before the flood. We're just starting to get there today. And so when their bodies died, 
they become disembodied spirits. That's the hero worship that is, is talked about in the Greek mythology, and they would do sacrifices for the death of their fallen leader because they're afraid of him coming back and haunting them. This is the same type of the vagabond spirits and the Chinese. This is this is common understanding about these demon spirits, and they're not humans. These are disembodied giants, and they're the ones that are haunting them because they died in a way that didn't permit them to go to Hades or Sheol to be with their gods and their belief system. And they weren't sent to the pit prison. They weren't part of the terrible ones um, who are in the pit prison, who also will come out of the, the pit prison in Revelation 9 with the fallen angels that were locked there for those crimes that they committed both before and after the flood. Not all angels and fallen angels are in the abyss prison. So, these giants uh, have some restrictions that were put on them. And, and the Nephilim could produce in great numbers easily uh, before the flood. But there's something different that goes on after the flood. So the Raphaim, which are the terrible ones um, after the flood, as you take that word terrible one, it's the Hebrew word erit. In the singular form, and a retim, as in the plural, as in ones, as in terrible ones, or Nephilim would be the giant ones, seraphim angels would be the serpent faced dragon ones, um, gibberim are the mighty ones. So understand that as a male plural versus the AH female plural. And that <clears throat> these eritim uh, were the terrible ones, accorded, this recorded in a really uh, strange prophecy, and until you understand it, it's a bit scary and creepy. You have Pharaoh talking to the mighty in the pit prison, the abyss, which are the fallen angels, and to the terrible ones that are in the sides of the pit prison who were slain on the earth and did terrible things. Typically, that'd be associated with decapitation, just as the Egyptian execration text says that's the worst death you could have is to be beheaded. One is is because you couldn't repair yourselves and uh, and you didn't were either void of or didn't have time to complete the rituals to have you go to Sheol, Hades, the other world, Argatha, a thousand different names for that location where those polytheist gods rule from in the earth in another dimension. And so uh, this Eretim are defined as you know, tyrants and bullies, just as Nephilim are described as. And as you get into all of the descriptions, you have this interesting two parts to it that is really kind of strange, is that they are the ones who are childless and a fertility issue of, uh, of some um, sort. And I don't think that's a fertility issue in terms of sperm or ovum. I think they had an inability to produce females. Uh, so something changed in uh, how the counterfeit spirit was added on. They don't have that immortal spirit that's going to be allowed to stay in a body, but they're more limited in power and they have this fertility issue. And so that word erit is the root word in the compound part of a compound word, ug erit. And so Arit is the city of Ugarit. Um, and Ug is the root for, as it comes out of Hebrew, King Og, the last of the Raphaim. And so this would be Kiriath, as it would be known as Kiriath Arba, the city of Arba, which we now know as Hebron, which was the founder or patriarch of the Anakim giants after the flood, according to the book of Joshua. Um, this would be the city of King Og, the terrible one. And Og is the last of the Raphaim, Rapha for giant, as that goes back, versus Nephilim. Uh, and Nephilim is only a term used to reference giants before the flood, biblically. Um, and we don't get reference to giants after the flood using the Nephilim term. Is that Og is the last of these uh, giants, and it's it's in the Ugaritic text where these Raphaim, Rapiu, Rapiem, or original Semitic RPM, are created as giants, dynastic kings, the royals, part of the Datanu assembly, part of the assembly of the gods that Baal is heading after the flood, and that Rapha 
that that is is split into in terms of meaning uh, in Hebrew, it can mean 7495 as a healer, which is the source word, 7496 for a she or a shed or a demon spirit or an evil spirit, which is the disembodied spirit aspect of Raphaim. And then 7497 in, in the Strong's lexicon for Hebrew meanings is uh, the tribe of giants. And so in the Ugaritic text, they're listed as these giants. They're listed as these royales and diamonds. And they're healers, just as the Fisher King concept reflects that as well, where the ancient kings, let's say, like even in the ages of the Merovingians, had the ability to heal. It was part of this process, and they had the ability to heal. Uh, and that's why the only way you could kill the giant is to take the head to do it till so suddenly they couldn't self-repair themselves, whether it was through something in their DNA or it was a technology. But seemingly they, they had that sort of ability to do that. And they're doing in the Ugaritic text fertility rituals to bring Baal, Ashtaroth, and Nat, all the different giants that are associated with the Baalim back to create more Raphaim because they have this fertility issue. And because they can't get that resolved and, and those gods aren't coming back because the ones before the flood went to this pit prison, those ones that created the giants as the aboriginals and before Babel um, for, for the dispersion of the people, those gods, the offspring gods, Zeus, um, Aphrodite, um, you know, all the different goddesses' names uh, in the Olympian post-Diluvian pantheon or all the offspring gods who participated in that, they went to the pit prison as well. So the reason why that dilution then comes about is they have a choice. They can go extinct or they can start to reproduce with human females. And that's where you start to create the hybrid nations. And uh, they do this because they have to, because they just can't produce enough. So the fertility, if I'm following the fertility rights that we know of today from, you know, historical and like, you know, mythological record, I guess those were actually for the giant class. They weren't necessarily for humans having a problem reproducing. It was for the giants yeah. having problems reproducing. Yes. Yes. And you can do fertility what, and, rituals for the land and stuff like that. There's different fertility issues. So you have to look at the context. And is there, would there be any benefit for the giants uh, getting humans to participate in the fertility rituals? Do they just like get some sort of inherent benefit from you know, getting someone that's not them to participate in the fertility. No. Does that make does my question make sense? No, I'm not sure. I I, I might have like, to do so it, if, but if, you can... if the uh, fertility rituals that we're talking about that weren't just for crops, right? But the yeah. Nephilim fertility rituals or the the pre-flood giant fertility rituals. I assume that over some period of time, humans adapt them and take them on as if they were always there fertility rituals is that done by design so that the giants yes. intentionally want humans to do fertility rituals because it benefits the giants in some way well typically number one is you wouldn't have fertility issues in any sort of shape way or form before the flood but you get them after the flood which is sort of one of okay. those idiosyncrasies and so the fertility issues that the giants are doing is is to bring their gods back so they can produce more giants fertility issues downstream from that would be to do fertility issues just to sort of be blessed that they could produce somehow some way and they would do sacrifices to the gods of humans to do that and typically the demigods who also thought of themselves as the spurious offspring that with the divine right to rule uh, for their celestial mafia godfather um, who created them <laughs> uh, you know i love that term too <laughs> so um so I use it every once in a while. Um, and so they would be looking at the sacrifices that they do onto the gods that would give the gods, if they were still ruling and there still is a council of gods, they would gain power from that in their belief system. And so would the demigods receive some sort of power on that, generally by drinking the blood. 
or the quickening, which is the uh, matriarchal allegory to that whole ritual. Yeah, there's there's so many angles we can go in here. I'm I'm trying to pull <laughs> threads slowly and uh, just just so that we don't get completely tangled up in a bunch of them. Um, so I want to I want to go to the, like the original Nephilim pre-flood. Yep. Uh, this is sort of like the first wave of, in a simple term. What is the practicality of this? Like, what what are there any uh, like reasonable concepts of? Here's how the Watchers came down. Here's how they copulated. I assume it wasn't uh, like like basically immaculate conception. There was probably an actual yeah. process yeah. So, here. Like, what what actually happened? So, first of all, from uh, the Book of Enoch, you get. 200 watchers uh, who swear an oath of harem anathema to carry it out to the end. And they're the ones who produce the original giants. There's more creations after that initial act before the flood. And then again, obviously, as we've talked about after the flood uh, in polytheism, you have the gods walking amongst us, both male and female in a physical body as opposed to an angel is typically understood from a Christian perspective as a spirit, right? But biblically, we can see angels take a physical body. So in the Sodom and Gomorrah narrative and just before where um, the angel of the Lord shows up to Abraham, he's accompanied by two angels that Abraham doesn't quite recognize as a human right away, but they're interacting physically. They're touching, they're drinking, they're eating. And then those two angels go on to Sodom. And one other reference in case there's Christians out there who wonder how this come about as well. Hebrews 13 talks about being nice to strangers unless you come across an angel unaware. So sometimes angels are recognized as angels in a physical form. Sometimes they're not. So we know they can take a physical body and a gender of their choice as what's described in Polythe theism which is where the mother goddess comes from and they have the ability to reproduce and polytheism with themselves which i don't think that they did but uh, and also with with humans and this is a constant around the world so how does that happen if they're a spirit being how can they take a physical body so they but what we do know is biblically they can do it so typically in this world there's a soul and a body that's the oiketarian that we talked about. But in, uh, the, in, in the Christian world, there's also a spirit that comes from heaven. And that would be also the original spirit of, of the gods or the fallen angels. And there's a passage in Jude 1, 6 and 2 Corinthians 5, 2 that talks about in Jude 1, 6, the habitation that these gods or fallen angels left, which is heaven. And that's the Greek word oiketarian, meaning a dwelling place for the spirit. So there's a dwelling place in heaven, as it's also described as oiketarian as the house of heaven in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, a place where your body dwells so it can interact properly in the spirit realm, where gods and angels are originally uh, derived from. But when they go to the physical world, they can be in a spirit form or physical form. And so they create their own oiketarian. And if you create your own body, you create your own DNA. Now, if you're going to have that physical act, that's how it's passed on. And, and with in, that, in that same the, line of, of the practicality, what's like the gestation uh, speculated to be? Is it like uh, acts like a normal human child up until it's delivered and then like the, the gigantism sort of kicks in? Well, in uh, the Kebra and the Gast on the original Nephilim is that the, the mothers could not carry the baby. So they had to do a ritual and a sort of um, cesarean type of pregnancy that was so horrible that all the mothers died in favor of the demigods being produced. So I don't know whether all the original mothers after the flood died i only get that account that's talked about after the flood um and it sort of again sort of denotes that just maybe they were larger and again we don't get anything that i can really rely on but they are born walking as a lot of the oral traditions and less um things that i can get my hands on so i can't say that they that the that's 100 percent accurate but 
there's a consistency to the message that they mature quicker and grow faster. Uh, similar to like other animals, uh, you know, that are born and they can walk, right? There's something added to their nature that can do that along with like, say, their, those healing gifts, for example. And uh, Nephilim before the flood didn't have the same sort of fertility issues as after the flood. And nope. that's kind of had great harems of right? had great harems of Nephilim women. But you see, it's not that there aren't any giants women's after the flood. Like you have the Amazons, which is post diluvian. There's a whole tribe of them, and they're maybe there for their own protection because a lot of times what happened with these rival giants is they would kill each other's harem as well because it's about mm-hmm. dominance with the giants and the rivalries. But there there gets to be a point where the females really become prized because they are now used to create new dynasties and particularly sort of downstream and that this is where the fairy allegory of the matriarchal bloodline comes from like as in fairy and as an owl versus the dragon and the raven which is the patriarchal allegory for the bloodline and patriarchy and matriarchy are equally important in the genealogies and new dynasties were set off as i talk about in book one with the most purest and the most ennobled bloodlines of females um and biblically we actually get um an example of that where you have uh timna which is a horim giant that's recorded in Genesis 36, which is the daughter of Seir, one of the patri- patriarchal tribes of the Horim in the Mount Seir region, um, is is the daughter, and he's a he's a he's a giant Horim, and so she's going to marry Eliphaz, who is the son of Esau, the brother of Jacob, who is the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, and going to create the Amalekite hybrid nation and a new dynasty that's considered quite noble and part of the elven uh, allegory of matriarchal bloodlines that set. So you have a royal bloodline of of Abraham uh, down through Jacob, down through uh, Esau, down through Eliphaz intermarrying. And that sets up a rival to if all of Israel were to be destroyed, for example, they would by law in the Old Testament inherit the inheritance rights, the blessing rights, and the Messianic rights, and put their own dragon messiah on on the throne. And Amalekites are different than the Amalekim that's shown in Genesis 14 that show up hundreds of years before. Those are the giants that lived around Petra and are in the war of four giant, you know, four four kings against five in in the war of giants, as I like to call it, because most of the nations are well, all the nations are either giants or hybrid nations that are that are fighting and so amalek is is the name provided and named sort of as a patriarch that's eponymously named after the malachim and they go and live in petra where the amalekim is one of their central locations for those giants and so you have this new dynasty that's set up and they're the nation that's waiting for israel as soon as they come out after the exodus to wipe them from the face of the earth. I mean, this is not coincidental stuff. It's all there in the detail if you want to get into it. And it's just sort of a look into um, those marriages. So in book one, I give lots of examples, particularly with the Egyptian pharaohs, how they would select wives to start new dynasties. Uh, and it had to be a specific purebred sort of, but that's how you sort of bring these things together is these different kind of data points. I've got a little bit of a tangent here, if you'll, if you'll bear with me, but I just want to get your, your thought on this. Because as you were talking about that, it reminded me of a thread that I've been tying at for a little while. And that's um, the book Golden, or the, the long series of books called The Golden Bow by Fraser, And he really emphasizes this concept of the older religions really being heavy on matriarchs and having the yeah. lineage kind of passed down through that female line and that there was almost like a Southern switch moment where it be turns into the patriarchy and outside of the golden bow, but there's other threads that I've been pulling out here that lots of these modern day mystery cults, you know, secret societies. One of the better examples might be like a Bohemian Grove style cremation of care ceremony, right? It is a men's only club. 
It's very patriarchal. And this concept of the patriarchy now, not in like the 2023 definition of patriarchy, but patriarchy in that when I die, I pass everything down to my son. And when he dies, he pat like this big ball of wealth that just keeps getting rolling downhill over time. Yeah. And yeah. what happens though, is that there's absolutely no meritocracy at this point. It's j- just that if you were born of my loins, you get the yeah. world. Whereas yeah. in matriarchy, it was the inverse. It was that it was a rule of conquest. You had to come from like a strange land and you had to defy all odds and you had to win all sorts of different, you know, challenges. And then finally you'd have to go and essentially kill the king to, in order to take the daughter. But the way yeah. that you're describing all this is almost like it makes so much more sense, that whole conquest and why would you risk everything to go and find some strange woman in some faraway land unless yeah. that would guarantee you to ha- yes. to give birth to like this nephilim offspring the that would then dynasty. kind of be like yep. a giant right yeah yeah it starts to make a whole lot of sense and they'll tell you as you go higher up in the secret societies and that illuminati is not very high so let me just sort of explain that there's a thalamic tree that they have for their organizational structure. Um, and these are trunk organizations. So Freemasonry is first level adept. So third degree in the old system, you would, might recognize it as the York, right? But third degree in all the religious aspects is the old system. First level of adept. And 33rd degree was created uh, 100 years or so ago and split the three 11 ways and created uh, just uh, kind of a different way, but it's all meaning the same thing, right? So it's the same steps and everything, the same knowledge. And so if you are going to oversee multiple lodges, you're going to be fifth degree in the old system. And so Illuminati centers around the adept level as it merged into part of the organizational structure, but was utilizing the lodges uh, around the world that was set up sort of as, as home basis for them as they took their particular agenda out into the world. And they're all working together. They each have different agendas. And so as you move up from the, so you could probably say those are probably uh, four and five level degrees. And as you get into Rosicrucianism, you might be as high as seven degrees. Uh, I don't know how high it goes, but as you get into the Royal bloodlines they it goes much higher some people say 33 so if you multiply that by another three in the scotty system it'd be close to like 100 degrees um so i've been told there's 33 degrees up to 100 degrees some people say more all i know is there's as the higher you go is is the higher level that you're at and along with that and then understanding that uh, even though you have Lilith as a queen of heaven, as a mother goddess, that is the owl representation with Bohemian Grove, it's dominated by a patriarchal identity and membership system, which is at the lower levels. The higher you go, the matriarchy does become more important. And the belief system is, is that at one time it was either the more powerful or equal, depending on who you're talking to. And it even goes back into the different gods so that you have um, Sophia, for example, in Gnosticism created through some sort of male nebulous life force, uh, 12 archons that the God of the Bible is said to be part of, Satan is to be part of, and the other uh, gods of those original 12 archons. And so she's kind of above that level. And she's on the same sort of understanding as, you know, that male goddess that is the supplier of all knowledge as, 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 as well as we talked about a little bit earlier on on in the show. And that's reflected in, uh, particularly with the Anjou, part of the bloodlines that go back into prehistory. They have a fleur-de-lis kind of as sort of the Lilith aspect, but they have like a reflection or a substitutable icon that is a bee that overlays onto the same fleur-de-lis. And you might look at that. And that comes from their ideology that there's a queen bee. And then underneath the queen bee are the male workers. 
or I mean, the male drones. And then underneath that is the working class, right? And so that's the hive mind as well. And they, there's a belief that in their system that at one time they had telepathy between the giants and people of the of the pure genes and that as working together they could achieve things that you couldn't working alone and so it works through in the higher levels this this matriarchal chief goddess and what's kind of interesting in all pantheons around the world you have a similar story um, of leviathan uh, where there's a male and a female and in prehistory in the bible god killed the female because the world couldn't survive with two of these creatures and leviathan is a bit of an allegory as well for satan as being uh male and one of those gods that are going to be destroyed in the end time just as he produces the beast empire and the multi-headed hydra dragons and leviathan like well if you go into any pantheon it doesn't matter whether it's norse doesn't matter whether it's the popol vuh and the aztec doesn't matter whether it's the uh subcontinent of india for example they will have um indra that kills verta the leviathan type female in their pantheon you've got marduk killing and baal killing lotan yam and the different variations of the names that come out of the ball cycle right the one that predates a lot of the other cycles that kind of follow it yeah yeah, so they have that same sort of story, and the thought is 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 that that is the mother goddess that isn't dead, but is in the pit prison uh, that will also be released in the end time. And one of the things that they're working for is to bring back the old system, where you would have that duality uh, of the mother goddess, male and female, and with the original one, that's going to be part of the release of the pit prison in the end time. You're, you're honestly blow my mind with the queen bee analogy because that makes so much sense <laughs> as like the, the, even the ancients or even modern, just observing that happening in nature and yeah. surmising like, oh, that's what's yeah. actually happening, sure. uh, you know, as above, so below. That's, that's yeah. blow my mind right well, now, Gary. Well, and just think about the royal jelly that uh, is used to feed the royales and is sort of supplied through whatever the worker bees do to provide food and stuff. And then that's also used in part to create new queen bees. I mean, that's, you, you can't what's get the direct much more analog to that. Like, well, what's what's could, the direct human analog of, of Royal jelly? Uh, blood. Drinking Just straight blood. up blood. Yeah. Yeah. And or, you know, like you, you have this thing in, in the matriarchal line that's the quickening that was shown in the Highlander movies in the 80s and 90s and then in the TV series where there can only be one. So these are like superheroes. These are. And of course, if you take their head, then you get all of that power. And that's called the quickening. And so the quickening is that energy life form allegory that's in the blood that vampires drink which dracula means son of a dragon um based on vlad the impaler a noble to author dudanan uh royale who takes his bloodlines back to the agrathy uh, tribe produced by a patriarchal nephilim or Raphaim after the flood i should say more accurately accurately saying hercules um and hercules is the son of zeus and alchemy a human female and they keep these genies genealogies back into prehistory so that's why you have like charles the third the king when he was still prince he said he takes his genealogy back to vlad the impaler who dracula is based on and of course you have a complete allegorical meaning overlaid onto the vampires with the nephilim drank blood to make their life last longer uh well, after they i've lost been working on a on a really loose theory but that the secular version of what you're describing here of like this royal jelly or this blood yep. drinking and quickening. Yep. But if you don't believe in, in hocus pocus, if you don't believe in the Bible and you're like just a straight up, you know, a atheist Gary from before yep. all your research. Yeah. What do you think about the topic of adrenochrome being yep. this like secular description of that exactly of like this royal jelly? Yep. Yeah, or a royal blood as, as, a, as it manifests. So typically you understand it's the gene that produces the blood, right? That's passed on. So it's a manifestation, which is how you get the Rh negative in with Rh positive because you can't add something not there 
<laughs> into something, right? So they call that the gene of Isis as the, uh, again, female mother goddess that is this gene that they track as in genealogy, right? And so that's why the matriarchal part is is so important. And it's also known, like the Anjou will call it, the fairy gens or the elven gens uh, of the Tuatha Dut and Ann. Um, there's also, uh, it's, that would also have another cognate term in, in, in their understanding. It's called the Elbi gens, gens Latin for a specific patriarch. You could look at that as the patriarchal Nephilim or Rephaim or the Celestial Mafia Godfather that originally started the line. And Elbi, which means pale white, which of course, Dracula's pale white, Vlad was pale white as the ultimate noble sort of Celt. And most of the giants are all pale white as they're described. Not all, but most. And the Julia Jans would be the line of the black nobility that people might be familiar with, which is another term for Rex Deus uh, or Royale. Royale is a transliteration of El for an angel or a god in the Bible. And just as Baal means Lord God, Al, uh, Royale goes back to Old French for king and then back to, to uh, Latin into regal and back into rule into Indo-Aryan. Indo-Aryans were the post-Diluvian giants. And you also, and there were Indo Aryans before, at least with the same language. Um, and Al, it really means kings of God, right? These are, they're telling you in their titles and their names and things everything you need to know because they like to do things sort of in, in, in plain sight. So, yeah, there's a, a, a significant sort of connection to the genes that produces this blood. So Rh negative typically is the manifestation of the Royal bloodline. So the Windsors are like O negative. Uh, most of the presidents who take their bloodlines back to the Plantagen A, um, which is the junior offshoot through intermarriage of the Anjou, um, are O negative. Um, you get RH negative that is dominates the 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 the, the royal houses and all, and most of the nobility. Um, so there's a definite connection there. And there's one other interesting connection with the bees as well. So in the Bible, when Israel is going up against these giants and hybrid giants who, through their mythos, would have this hive mind. One of the things that God does to provide help for Israel is to send hornets to discombobulate the giants so that they could just go up and cut their heads off. And so the hornet, I thought, well, that's really kind of weird. Why would you send hornets? You could all do all sorts of different things. Why hornets? Well, the hornet is the natural enemy of the bee. And it just seems right. to uh, sent them into absolute panic. And so it's the only way they could defeat defeat these giants was through this kind of support you're continuing to blow my mind here i've got to i want to be meticulous about the rest of the questions i've got for you okay uh, and i want to be mindful of your time so i've got a little segment here that we're just going to jump right into i'll exp i'll explain the rules in just a second hey conspiracy buffs i double dare you to take some pcp the paranormal conspiracy probe on your marks get set and go Okay, no one would forgive me if I don't run through this segment, so I'll give you the the quick rules. It's very easy. I'm just going to mention a topic, or yeah. I'm going to mention like a scenario, and you just give me a 1 to 10 rating. 1 meaning you don't okay. believe in it at all, you think it's silly. 10 meaning yep. that you're writing a book on it now, and you're going to be pushing yep. it in like a month from now. Okay. So, starting right off the bat, Flat Earth, from 1 to 10. Uh, 1 agnostic on it um dragons in that fire breathing flying dragons with scales as we're told have ever existed on the planet ever 10 already have written about it uh how about the classic uh concept of dinosaurs yes i would put that uh, as a 10 as well and closely associated with the dragons in different format though um, that a human being has stepped foot on the moon in the last 100 years? Yeah, five. Okay. A, a, a little on the fence, ambiguous on it. Um, that the, you know, that moon landing footage was faked, the one that got broadcast uh, worldwide. Five. 
Five. Uh, the concept of a Bigfoot. Nine to ten. Uh, that Bigfoot is related to Kane. One. Um, okay, this one's going to be specific because there's a follow-up to it. So the first one is the little gray X-Files aliens. The, the grays. Ten. And then uh, shape-shifting reptilians, uh, which are like a counterpart to the grays. Nine to ten. <laughs> that aliens and demons are the same thing. Uh, I'll, I'll do 10, but a qualification, not all aliens are demons. Okay. Square, square and rectangle sort of uh conundrum, yep. right? Yeah. Okay. Here's a scenario for you. This one, I'm interested in your, your take very much. So, so an atheist, again, an atheist, Gary, I don't know what age, let's say 20 or something, right? Is that still kind of atheist Gary yep. range? Yep. Yep. 20 so and 20 lower. year old yep. Gary in, in 2023, goes on Amazon and he searches for how to summon a demon for dummies and the idiot's guide to summoning demons. And I don't know, Anton LaVey's, you know, satanic Bible for good measure. And maybe it's secret doctrine uh, just to top it off. And you get all the books and you read them all end to end. And you, then you start practicing like the actual rituals and you start drawing the sigils and you do the things that these books say one to 10 that you could possibly summon an actual demon and damn yourself forever just from reading those books. Well, so you can summon a demon without losing your soul. You could have interaction with a demon without losing your soul. Is there an ethical way in 2023 to say like command demons or daemons similar to how Solomon did with his, his ring? Well, biblically, he didn't do that. That's mostly in polytheist legend and outside the canon. I'm not saying he okay, didn't can have you the power that to do just it. A little bit. Yeah. Could you correct well, me on that a little bit? Cause that's, that's my perception is that King Solomon got like a magical pass from, you know, the, the, the hall monitor, I guess. Yeah, so you don't get that anywhere in the Bible. Um, and, but the Quran will talk a little bit about it. But particularly in polytheism, they draft Solomon as being one of their great black magicians in that he right. um, wasn't monotheist, he was polytheist, polytheist, and he had the ability to control the demons. And he could command them, and he used them to help build the temple and things like that. And uh, he's very much part of, of, of their mythos, but that's not biblical. Um, so leave it up to people whether or not they want to believe that he had that power. He may have. We're just not told that biblically. So um, lots of sources that would suggest that. Um, and ev But even the ones that would be a little bit more monotheist would say that he used it to build the temple, but that he wasn't evil. Right, he didn't lose his 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 uh, his uh, spirit that way. So, I'm a little bit careful with that one. Um, uh, and certainly, he's an important figure. But it's not unusual for the secret societies, Gnosticism, uh, which is the religion of the secret societies, Theosophy, as they developed, which also produced the New Age. Um, they draft biblical patriarchs into their religious nature they just redefine them through allegory and things and additional okay. information they say they have Hiram of Tyre a good example where they're almost explicitly saying it's not the same guy even though it is the same guy it gets yeah that's a, actually a really good question let's say there's like a well, 30 second second yeah. degree Scottish Rite Mason yeah. out there yeah. and they're getting invited to be the 33rd degree what's yeah. Gary Wayne's suggestion do they go and infiltrate do they get out and run away and repent like what what do you do in a situation like that in a situation like what well, there's a, let's just say someone out there right now is listening and they're a 32nd yep. degree scottish right mason oh, they're right. invited to be a yep. 33rd degree do I they gotcha. say yep. like never mind i'm out of here and they run do they infiltrate and report back do they start yep. passing around you know i don't like well, what, do you, what do you do to them for at this, a suggestion at this, at this, at this point right now, you've sworn oaths, but they're not binding of any sort of form. Um, and you're going to go into the next level. And that's when your big choice comes along. 
And you're going to be told things that are going to change every preconceived notion that you ever thought. And everything you've been taught isn't really the truth yet because you're too mundane. You're not considered ready to know the true knowledge. So at the third degree or the 33rd degree Scottish rite, you're going to find out that Lucifer, Halel, as I would call him biblically, as one of his many names, Gadrael, as he's known as in uh, the book of Enoch, um, is going to be, you're going to be told he's the great architect of the universe and the God that you need to worship. Before that, you can believe in any God. You just have to believe in a God as part of the lower levels. At that point in time, you're going to start to swear that oath. And that's where you're on uh, the sliding scale that I would be, I would caution you not to go down. Um, again, it's not that you can't renounce that, but you will be held accountable for it. But again, once you buy into that knowledge and the things, you're going to do the things that are going to prevent you, you from being saved. So um, there's a point where there is no return. Best not to get a look at it. Are these just like oral oaths we're talking about or or do you think that there's actually like things that you have to do that would, you know, violate ethics and morality? I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm not an adept, so these are secrets that, um, you know, in the old traditions and people can decide whether or not that is part of today is, is if you let those traditions and secrets out at that level, there's a punishment of death that is associated with. Yeah, at the 32nd degree, after you take the oath, I don't know what you have to do to fulfill that oath or the obligations to prove that oath are. I would imagine there are because everything in polytheism has tests, right? It's just sort of part of that whole system. So it's after that that you're going to be concerned with in terms of whether or not you're going to go beyond uh, the point of no return. All right, so be beware anyone out there that's thinking about going to the 33rd degree. I guess that's like the first real test. And I've heard that a lot. Yeah. I have no idea what that would entail because it's yeah. super, now, super secret. It is. Well, and it comes with punishment of death in the old traditions, whether or not they still do that today to, to leak that out. Now, do be aware you could be told that somebody is a 32nd degree adept. So they're either they don't know what they're talking about or they are so high, they're way beyond the 33rd degree in the Scottish Rite. And what that means in the system in terms of the bloodlines is that you are a royale of a pure bloodline and you are taught from childhood within the family uh, and are initiated. You are, you are an adept before you are an adult, but you're not allowed to take your adept title until you're somewhere between 25 and 30 years old is what I'm told. And that uh, they will take a title as a bloodline as a 32nd degree adept um, until they're of the age to receive that full adept title. So you may hear that. And uh, uh, I was actually interviewed by a quote unquote 32nd degree adept and he said well what would you think and I we weren't talking about this and uh, he said what would you think if you were a 30 sec if I told you I was a 32nd degree adept then I gave him both of those options so I said which are you and he said the first and uh, or I mean the latter in terms of the royal bloodline um, and that he was still waiting for his adept title and then he was going to go publish it and we we're going to do more interviews and then he got his hand slap for lack of a better word and it was just this non-stop diatribe of awful messages and he wasn't going to publish it and he wasn't going to do any more interviews <laughs> <laughs> so i got one other parting biblical question um and i'm just curious because it is one of the most i guess like controversial passages that i've come across but what do you think ham saw in the tent when it says that he saw no one naked and it was like this unforgivable yeah. sin where he's, you know, basically he screwed for life. You get the curse of ham, which yeah. may or may not be conflated with the curse of Cain, depending on. But what do you think he actually happened in that tent? Is it allegory? Yeah. Is it literal? Like what happened? It's, it's a little of both. So 
the curse is a prophecy that is fulfilled with Canaan, right? And so it's like the uh, curse uh, in Genesis 3.15 of the serpent. It's a curse that's going to be fulfilled through the prophecy. Now, it comes, so it doesn't happen with Ham doesn't receive the curse, and, and Canaan's brother doesn't receive, brothers don't receive the curse. It's just on Canaan. So the language in the Bible is uncovered and, and knowing and words like that. And so in this case, uncovered. And that's described in the biblical laws when you uncover somebody is that you're having a sexual relationship. So typically, if you uncovered, uh, let's say, Noah's wife, uh, she would be disgraced and uncovered, and so would the male. So there's different levels of, of the shame that would go with it. And most people think, well, who get this far would say that it is uh, Ham having sex with Noah's wife, but she's not mentioned in the narrative. And in the laws in the book of Leviticus and elsewhere, when it's talking about these laws, the one who was harmed is also mentioned, even though it will pass on the shame to the spouse. So it could be vice versa. But the one who is being uncovered is always named as part of the law. And so it's Noah who became intoxicated. It's Noah who passes out. It's Noah who becomes uncovered. And it's Noah who awakes when his wife isn't around and realizes he's been uncovered. And so this is talking, in my opinion, and I put this in book two, and I have a document on this if people want to get a hold of me. I have a document on a lot of things I talk about. So if you get a hold of me through the website, I can send you a document. You have to name it by topic because I have a lot of documents. I do those at no charge. Um, so, and in book two, I, I put this in as part of talking about the Canaan curse and the Canaan, Canaanite hybrids that create the patriarchless families and that this is a, a strategy employed by Canaan afterwards to say, I'm not going into servitude. I'm going to live amongst the giants and provide my daughters to create the original giants after the flood and um, create the Canaanite tribes. So it's, it's a sexual act and it's a sexual act in my opinion and i lay this out in in pretty good detail in the document and in the book that it's it's ham that is harmed now this is a sin that is applied in a lot of accounts in polytheism and in one book that could be polytheist could be have roots in the book of enoch it's the book of the lomech of cain talks about the homosexual nature of giants and i think it's more after the flood but the one in the Lamech of Cain is talking also before the flood that this was one of the traits of the giants. So just as you have like the the Greeks and let's say Alexander the Great who you would sleep with humans or I mean with males that this was a common sort of trait and one of the abominations and that's the cause of the curse. So it has sort of a cascading a uh, set of events that happen with this curse that's laid throughout the prophecy. So if I, if I'm hearing that right, um, and like it's again like simplified, it's not just that it was this sexual act that was profane and no. and looked down upon, but it was that that was a behavior that giants uh, did. So that like perpetuating also this yep. this giant practice was also just as yep. big of a sin. Yes, it was both. Interesting. I, I'm building up like a like a collection of all the different explanations for what happened in the tent. I, I like this one. This one's really interesting. I haven't. It's called the Lomech of Cain. Where did that come from? Well, it was put out uh, by the same person who published uh, the Lost King of Book of Ox. So his name is D E M O N. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's his writing name. So, um, so <laughs> interesting selection. Yes. So what he did was he was a priest out of the, the Roman church who had access to these um, church documents and translated it. And both of these books come out of the Manichaean book of giants which is based on the Enochian Book of Giants um, that uh, 
presents both of these two manuscripts and you know the whether or not the dating is that old it's a forgery or not hard to know but these are ancient sort of manuscripts that they that they that the priest translated for for Demond and uh you know put out two books on that so that would be one of the sources but there are there are others we could keep going. I'm not going to keep you uh, much longer here, though. But I wanted to just say thank you so much for coming and letting me poke your brain about all this. I got to ask questions directly to one of the only people that I'm even aware of being somewhat of an expert on this very niche topic uh, on the planet. So congrats and thank you. And this was awesome. <laughs> and and once again, the, your book series uh, is the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Uh, part one and part two and i just want to mention i was reading some of the reviews and the synopsis and and a, a number of people were calling it the genius six conspiracy i think as like a <laughs> like a credit to you so um, oh, okay. uh, it's it's really fascinating the number of yeah. different angles you go into this like i'm sure we could yeah. talk again for two hours just on the bavarian illuminati and then another one on yeah. just the cathars and then we could just keep going so we'll, we'll stop yeah. it here um, but again, <laughs> if there's anything else that you want people to look into, any place to go in and find you, uh, let them know right yeah. now. Yeah, so the you know the best place to get a hold of me is through my website, uh, the Genesis Six Conspiracy dot com. That's the number six Conspiracy dot com, and on that website, I have a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters of book one and all 84 chapters of book two that just released yesterday uh if you're i think the printed copy is only available in the u.s right now as they're catching up on 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 the orders and there's also a kindle version as well so if you want the digital version so you get a good feel for the book and whether or not it's it's either one is the book for you you don't have to read one to read the other but one will uh, lead you to read the other and there's a generous excerpt but my books if you're not familiar with me i give you so much information and it never stops coming at you um right through to the last paragraph there's no loose paragraphs in there that's a small drop in the bucket as to what's in the book just to give you um, a flavor and so you can buy a copy off that you can go to book one or book two if you're in canada there's a canadian page mm -hmm. if there if you're in the u.s there's a u.s page if you live anywhere else in the world there's an international page same way for ordering book two and on that website for both those buy pages you can link over to amazon.com barnesandnoble.com um, amazon.ca and over to the kindle edition to get the digital copy so that's the best way to get a hold of me and my books is through the website and if you wanted to get a document or ask me a question there's a contact the author uh, icon there and if you hit that uh, that's my email address which is uh, genesis six conspiracy again the number six genesis six conspiracy at gmail.com it may take me a month to get back to you but i will get back to you uh, and again, thank you so much for spending your time with me today out of all the different people I'm sure you could have been talking to. I really do appreciate it. This has opened my mind up to a bunch of different <laughs> threads that I'm going to keep pulling at. So I'll be devouring uh, both of those books uh, in entirety. And yeah, and, and I just wanted to throw out a shout out to I guess this is the perfect time. I'll make myself bigger. But this is the Nephilim Portal Baby playset that I had been working on way before that I even knew that this was like a deeper thing. This was a reference that uh, me and Joel Thomas from Merkel media yeah. had been working on uh, just yeah. conceptually, but it came together. It's kind of a cute yeah. little thing. I don't yeah. know how accurate it is uh, in terms of like, look, uh, yeah. but yeah, we've got it looks good though. I don't know. How, what, do I have any, any feedback? Does this look like a watcher or would it be more grotesque? Would it be all eyeballs? Well, depending on which watcher you're talking about, because there's four groups of watchers. So Archangels had uh, a face of a human, but, you know, Seraphim had the face of a serpent. Um, the Cherubim had four faces, but typically when they took a form on the earth, they would take one face, whether it's an ox or a bull, I would say bull, based on what we get out of prehistory, had the face of a lion, as well as they've been shown around the earth on a face of a bird and the face of a human so they could be and i think where you get the gilgamesh giants from is from the cherubim watchers because he has the dark hair um, and he's larger i think he's mm. a bit unique 
Um, so you have, like in Pistis Sophia, you have all sorts of different looks and descriptions of these watchers from before the flood that were put in the pit prison. And that's a Gnostic gospel, but it's just, and, I, and people want those descriptions, get a hold of me. I'll just email that to you um, and tell you the passage that it's in. I just copied it out of my digital book. Um, so, and one of them you'll be interested to know, because you asked me about, um, uh, Bigfoot is that there's actually angels that had, you know, or gods that had uh, a monkey face or a bear face or an ape face. So that's part of angels look differently. And if they would have taken that form, whatever form they took, if they had multiple heads, uh, that they would produce giants or beings that look just like them. So I think the uh, Bigfoot would go back to as being a Nephilim like being, but from a different type of angel. Interesting. And, and you actually answered one of the questions I didn't get to, but that I, I had heard the, uh, that the concept of Nephilim and the Watchers mating with humans, that that's the part that people uh, sort of focus on because we're people and it's interesting, but that there was also yeah. animal counterparts to all that. So for yeah. every, uh, every person out there that was a Nephilim version, there was like Nephilim, what, bats and, and snakes and elephants and every other kind of animal. Yeah. Is that somewhat well, accurate? Well, you know, the Zibalba um, demigods out of the Popol Vuh, they had a bird face or an owl face. And they had uh, a branch of the Zibalba, it's with an X, um, that were called the House of Camazots. And it's a specific branch. And Camazots, if you Google that, that means bat house of the bat so then if you look and when you google that you're going to get this image of like batman's outfit which most superheroes are sort of based on are, are nephilim giants and and so yeah you have uh, like the tengu for example which are southeast asian giants and warriors and kings and priests and if you google tengu t-n-g-u you get these bird face warriors and stuff um and those are you know Ruben. So we have Anunnaki uh, in on reliefs in Sumeria. You have uh, ones that have these wide, huge legs and huge feet and sort of stocky, like, and they have wings. One is depicted with a human face, but other ones have a bird face or a falcon face or an eagle face. How you know they're that's the same sort of imagery, and that's just Trubum taking a form with one of those faces. So if you have a of carobs as they protected palaces and the gates to uh, Hades or through the portals and or the temples that they protected, uh, these are typically one face of a cherubim, just as you have those cherubim covering the throne of God in heaven. So it, what I would call from a Christian perspective, the counterfeit of the throne of gods and the imagery uh, with the rebellious angels who are the gods in polytheism. Uh, there's no shortage in rabbit holes with you, sir. And I appreciate it. <laughs> there isn't. This is, yeah. This is a preview of the book where like every single page, like you were saying, there's no filler paragraphs. Every one of them is like a highlighted paragraph. So yeah. Uh, Thanks for giving us sort of the uh, the Cliff Notes version on some of this. And uh, I'll have to schedule for months in the future again to, to keep going through this. And thanks again for your time, Gary. Appreciate you. Terrific. Thank you. And uh, just love talking about this. And I just love getting information out and connecting dots. And you can connect. It's amazing when you have a common history, how you can connect dots, no matter which culture you're talking about. Yeah, I, and I love the simplicity of the recommendation to look into the the parents uh, gods and then the offspring gods and then being separated by the flood. That's a genius yeah. way of of making it really easy to sort of absorb that. Yeah, and think about it. You can't kill an immortal being. Only the omnipotent would do that, and I don't know how that happens because I'm not part of that <laughs> omnipotence, obviously. Um, so when the offspring gods overthrew the parent gods and killed them, that's not possible. But it does make sense that those parent gods went to the pit prison. And then the offspring gods, when they 
did the same crimes after the flood, they also disappeared, which is why the Rephaim are trying to do fertility rituals and bring them back. And it also accounts for when ba- Baal dies. How does ba- how you know he can't die? He's an immortal. So he also, because he did the same crimes, went off to the pit prison. And all that happens is, is that the other angels in the rebellious crew or the, the the pantheons, they just move up to replace. They have a counterfeit assembly of gods uh as it's talked about in polytheism uh whether it was at napur or olympia or the different holy mountains names around the year or it's or it's, it's mount hermon uh it's all talking about this council of the gods that's talked about in psalms 82 over the 70 nations of the earth both before and after the flood and so this uh host as it's understood biblically, is a host of angels, which is defined as Hebrew Saba, which is an army of angels, which has rank and order. So if those gods disappeared or killed as they're allegorized in um, polytheism, then other ones would move up to replace them. So we still have a council of gods, the invisible ones ruling this earth through their visible ones, their spirits, the spirits offspring of the original giants. Um, whether or not they survive the flood or there's just recreation after the flood, they take their genealogies back to them that are ruling this world today. Man, I'm just, uh, anyone that's listening to this, that's actually interested in this topic like this is the jackpot you've you've kind of hit the the gold treasure and i'm going to have all the links to gary's books underneath but if you've made it this far you're probably already going to grab a copy because it's just going to be like the full unbridled version of everything that we just kind of dipped our toe into so again man uh thank you so much for coming on here and <laughs> letting me poke at your brain with all these questions uh, i li- i just love doing it it's fun. just fun for me yeah. <laughs> It's the Nephilim portal baby playset. Comes with a fallen angel, Nephilim baby, and portal to another dimension. One of the Paranoid American playsets. Collect them all at ParanoidAmerican.com. Disclaimer, these are custom art creations and not toys meant for wimpy little new world order babies. Don't eat the art, don't sue the artist. For more details, visit ParanoidAmerican.com.